Danny Foley, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Oh man, likewise. Uh, this is uh, this is definitely one that I've had on on my radar for quite a while, man. So I, I truly appreciate you having me on. It's an absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure. And we've we've spoken a little bit over the last couple of weeks because you know write an article for Sportsmith. We've had a little chat around this. I've seen your work. I saw the rave reviews from Stu McMillan on your presentation at Altis. So delighted to get you on. Absolutely delighted to get you on, meet you, put a face to a name, all that kind of stuff. But anyone that doesn't know who you are, Danny, before we get into the into the podcast itself, would you mind just giving us a bit of a, a brief bio and a bit of info on your story? Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, really, I've, I've been in this field now for about 10 years. Um, and the bulk of my work history was through my time at Virginia High Performance in Virginia Beach, uh, where I spent about six and a half, seven years there. And at VHP, we worked uh, pretty much exclusively with Navy SEAL, Naval Special Warfare population. Um, so even though, you know, I've only been a strength and conditioning coach is, is my you know proper title throughout my career, uh, that, that stint at VHP was, was entirely developed around injury restoration and pain management. Um, so it really gave me a, an incredible opportunity um, on so many fronts, but really for the sake of what we do now is really having a great understanding of the human body from the perspective of injury and pain. And I think that it's really helped me to see the body from a little bit of a different lens and kind of have a different archetype or priority for my training inputs, whether that be for the developmental side or for the restorative side. So since we uh, moved down here to Texas last at the end of the last year, um, I've been transitioning back into the sports performance side and, you know, still kind of doing some hybrid back and forth. I'm, I'm doing some developmental stuff and more conventional SNC work with uh, some high school, some college and some pro athletes. But still maintaining a good bit of that injury restoration, which is now really converted to more return to play mechanics. Um, and just kind of trying to find my footing. You know, I, I, I've had a lot of a lot of good and, and a lot of bad experiences in the last, you know, seven, eight, nine months now. Um, it's been a crash course for for learning. A lot of that has been on just the life side more so than the professional side. Um, but we're definitely having a lot of fun and, um, you know, really excited at, at some of the things that we've started to uh, develop and, and get involved with. So this is on the list of discussion points, but I'm fascinated to know, and this is probably something that when you're at barbecues or when you're at bars with friends, people ask you about, but what is the, what are the biggest takeaways from working with Navy SEALs from a psychological, from a attitude, um, all that kind of stuff from that point of view? Yeah. So I had absolutely no anticipation of getting into that. Um, it, it was something that just happened. Uh, and it was the best way that that could have formed for me because it never gave me a chance to, you know, go watch a bunch of Netflix documentaries and a bunch of YouTube videos and, and try to assimilate the culture. And, you know, with that community, especially, they detect that very quickly. And it is a very difficult uh, group of individuals or, or community to to penetrate and to develop trust with. I was very fortunate that our 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 boss and the founder of VHP was uh, you know a, a Navy SEAL for many years and, and had a great reputation. So I was able to kind of adopt that that trust, and it was just the most incredible experience um, and very important for me. I, I I learned so much about you know really kind of becoming a man and and becoming a professional. Uh, and doing so with with all of the the right act attributes, you know, integrity, communication, discipline. Um, but really, I think to to kind of give you one or two bullet points to answer the question there, that showed me a firsthand experience of what truly unrelenting commitment to excellent excellence looks like. It, it is just a totally different mindset of ignoring the problems or the constraints and the limitations and just really relying on figuring out how to solve problems. And, and the foremost part of that is being perceptive to your surroundings and being able to be a good conscious decision maker and being able to kind of evaluate how single decisions and what is you know often perceived as being mundane or, or even innocuous things 
how those accumulate into bigger things. So I would say that was number one. And then the second thing that, that I really took was uh, just how to have a very fierce loyalty for those that you, you care for and that you trust. Um, you know, with their world, everything is quite literally developed around life and death. So a lot of it is, is you know, a little bit of a, an exaggerated viewpoint for 99.9% for .9 of us. You know, we'll never understand that. Um, but in concept, there are so many things that you can extract from that. And I think for my own, my own sake, it really gave me a sense of gratitude and humility. Um, I, I'll never forget, man, I had one guy, um, you know, who came in one morning and, and he was, I was all flustered and bent out of shape about something probably completely irrelevant. And uh, he goes, hey, you good, man, what's going on? And, and I was like, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm pissed off about this or that or whatever. And he just kind of looked back and he just cracked a little smile and he goes, dude, you work in pajamas in a air controlled environment. What are you, what are you stressed out about? And that stuck with me because I was like, you know what? He's exactly right. Like, this is fun. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I, I, I am comfortable and in a controlled environment. Um, you know, so it was great for the relativity sake. And man, I just, uh, you know, I have so much admiration for all of those men and women, uh, the sacrifices and, and the, you know, just what they're subjected to on a day to day basis is truly astonishing. It's incredible. Interesting, super, super interesting. Right, let's dive into the 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 crux of the conversation that that we planned out, and it's based on I'm guessing some of the work that you presented at Altis, but the a lot of what you talk about in your blogs, your articles, videos, social media, and it's around fascia, and that's probably a topic or is a topic that hasn't been discussed at, at all, never mind in depth on this on this podcast. So I'd like to go there and and spend a lot of time there. So before we go any deeper, let's keep it super, super simple. And I'm going to ask you, what is fascia and why would, should we be interested in understanding more about it? Yeah. So <clears throat> first, the, the, the first thing to understand is that the fascial system is A, real. It's, it's palpable. It's a tangible tissue. Um, and it is essentially a global connective tissue that is highly enriched with sensory bodies, proprioceptors, mechanoreceptors, and it just has a very wide reaching responsibility and functionality. Now I'll preface everything for the sake of this podcast specifically in saying that there is definitely a lot of inconclusive evidence and things that still need to be more conclusively proven from a scientific standpoint. However, I think that there is a clear reason as to why the literature is lagging. And I also feel that there is a lot of intuition that we all understand and just maybe haven't put some terminologies to it. But the fascial tissue specifically is really just collagen, water, and has different concentrations throughout the body. So, to, you know, if we take, for instance, the plantar fascia of the foot or the IT band, that is a, a much more fibrous and, and, and dense tissue. Whereas if we go to the fascial that is, you know, kind of covering the abdominal region, it's much more of a watery medium. It's, it's much more elastic than it is fibrous. So even though this is one integrated and unified system and tissue throughout the body, there's different densities and concentrations throughout. The other thing that's of interest with the fascial system is that it is it has non-Newtonian properties. So it, it doesn't necessarily respond to stress or strain the same way that a muscle or other connective tissues like the ligaments and the tendons do. With all of that being said, the biggest priority with the fascial system for the sake of strength and conditioning coaches, physical therapists, athletic trainers, is understanding that there is an inextricable link with the fascial system and the musculoskeletal system. So I think about this like the or like the energy systems. And if we think about the basics of the energy systems, we understand that we have three primary energy systems that are all working at all times, just in different capacities or in fluctuating manners. So the number one thing that I'll get pressed on with the fascial stuff is, well, when are we not training fascia? Well, I, I understand that. But when we are doing a, a 5K, 
we are using different proportions of our energy systems as compared to when we're running a 100 meter sprint. So if we look at training parameters and the way that we can, can conduct and, and set up exercise, it works very similarly. There are going to be certain aptitudes that are going to be more predominantly musculotendinous based, but then there are going to be different, uh, different layers or parameters where it will be a little bit more fascial based. And we'll, I know we'll cover this and get into it, but you know, I think that's a really important starting point because with my, for my sake, nothing about this fascial approach or this fascial stuff is supplemental to what we've already understood and, and what we, you know, on a broad scale all do. My interest is just kind of deviating at a certain point once we reach these peaks of strength and once we've, we've established the foundations um, from a physical standpoint to really try to focus more on the integrative aspects of movement as opposed to just continuing to pursue progressive overload. And I do think that that's an important distinction. So when it comes to how you think about programming, how you think about your philosophy, does does this way of thinking in terms of understanding and integrating that fascial thinking, does it start from beginners all the way up? Or are you starting to try to understand it when you come into more advanced athletes how does how does that play out yeah so i definitely think that it is more so for the the athletes who are already established and and have developed kind of their their rudiments and their foundations um you know if i can just kind of preface this with a quick backstory the the origins of this for me um comes from a a specific event. And this was back when I was at VHP and I had an individual who uh, was just coming off of a a really nasty bout of deep thoracic cancer. And this was an active duty um, personnel. And, you know, he had, they had to crack his sternum, break all of the ribs on the right side of his body, cut through the pec, the serratus, the lat to get down there and get everything out. So when he came to me, he had very obvious asymmetries, um, but we had a high priority because he was ready to get back and go. So when I saw him, it it very quickly registered like, okay, the conventional stuff just is not going to work for this guy. We're going to have to do something different. So that led me to offset loading. Well, I wonder what happens if we put a 25 pound on this side of the barbell and a 10 pound on this side. And we started doing stuff like that. I'm like, okay, I like that. Well, that led me to this thing called fascial slings. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. And that led me to anatomy trains and Thomas Myers. So it started to kind of materialize from there. And I had, we had so much success with that individual that I mentioned in, in six weeks that I was like, okay, there's something to this. We need to look into this a little bit more. And so from that point, I started to kind of just really delve deeper and deeper and then have gotten to, you know, the points that I have now with really just the the total training archetype. But to get back to your point, everything about my work for a long time was was predicated on injury and pain, as I mentioned. So I'm now at a, in, a, in this kind of interesting space where now I'm trying to re, you know, uh, uh, re, reapply and redevelop some of these things and, and really figure out, okay, how much of this is for developmental athletes for the sake of high performance and people who have low, low injury histories. What I'll say at this moment is for pain and injury and for for cases is the one that I just mentioned, I think that the fascial-based approach definitively is is better. I I, I really do. I do believe that. I think for the performance side, it's a little bit more of like the side dish as opposed to the entree. Nobody's going to get around developing power, speed, acceleration, developing true levels of strength. But once you hit that point, and that's another one that's difficult to define, you know, we say how strong is strong enough? Well, is it different for a rugby player than a soccer player? I'd imagine so. I think that a second row rugby player needs to be more physically robust in terms of strength and power than a striker in soccer. However, whatever that context is, whatever that number is for you and your athletes, once we reach that point, I think it goes from pursuing progressive overload to actually deliberately pursuing the the ability to improve, or I'm sorry, to improve the ability to tolerate variability. And and so in other words, 
I want to express those strength and those power qualities in as many different ways as I can. I'm going to maintain those those fun, fundamental values of strength, but then I really want to expose the system to variability more than anything else because at the end of the day, sport is controlled chaos. We cannot continue to sit here and say that football is a sagittal and baseball is a frontal plane sport. I think that's really arbitrary. It's chaotic. There's so many different angles and aptitudes and vectors that we load through and that athletes are forced to to respond to. So I think that our training needs to mirror that as closely as we can without, you know, obviously becoming gimmicky. <clears throat> so we'll come on to that importance of variability and this way of thinking and way of programming and way of building a philosophy around an fascia. But firstly, I think it'd be prudent to start around actually assessing the fascial system and how you go about measuring quality, measuring how much of an impact you can have or can't have and where that kind of baseline is. How would you go about that? Yeah, well, man, I'm, I was so glad that this was going to be a part of our, our dialogue today because um, I actually just got back from a trip last week to South Carolina um, to meet up with uh, my buddy, Matt Aldridge, who's the strength and conditioning coach at uh, Ferrum University or Furman University, excuse me. Um, and uh, they, man, they just came off of an incredible season this past year. And, um, and him and I are actually going to be doing a, a collaborative project that's going to essentially be uh, the follow up to the Fascia Chronicles. Um, so we'll, you know, obviously be putting that out here at some point soon. But our goal with this, you know, to be perfectly candid, is, is to solve this question of how do we know when it's muscle? How do we know when it's fascia? How do we know when it's some combination, you know, of, of, of each? I wish that there was a clear and definitive way of doing this. I wish that it was something that was just tangible and objective and measurable. We have a couple of ideas that I think are going to uh, shed some light on how we can be a little bit more myopic to assessing the fascial system. But at the moment, measuring and, and tangibly uh, evaluating fascia is, is virtually impossible. It's, it's because, again, it's, it's inextricable and there's, there's so much to this. But the, the measures and the, the mechanisms that have been done in some clinical settings are, are just impractical and, and inaccessible to 99% of us, right? So what I put together here recently, um, and I just put out a little uh, ebook on this or whatever, but, um, you know, I, I came up with like a fascial line assessment battery. So if we think about our fascial lines, these are the, the primary fascial lines being the anterior functional line, the posterior functional line, the lateral functional line, and then the spiral line. Um, you know, these are things that have associating muscle groups and, you know, work in tandem together. So for this, it's, you know, it is a qualitative and it is a, a subjective analysis, but, you know, I'm looking at basically the ability to lunge forward to lunging backwards, doing it with more of a, a coiling pattern or almost, you know, trunk rotation pattern coming forward and then reaching overhead going back, then looking at a lateral to curtsy lunge. And then the third one looking at a single leg crossover hinge to a lateral trunk flexion or side bend. And then for the spiral line, looking at basically an upper body rotation uh, with the arms overhead from a split stance. So this was my way of essentially taking those primary fascial lines, which, uh, you know, I, I follow, you know, mostly the, the Stecco's influence and, and some of the anatomy trains and Tom Meyer's influence. And this is a pretty unanimous thing across the fascial um, experts, the true fascial experts, and essentially just looking at it as a functional movement evaluation right now. I'm not interested in scoring it. <clears throat> you know, there's no need to do anything superfluous. For me, the way that I look at this is actually, I want to do number one, I want to give them as least amount of input as I can in terms of instructing the movement. I'm going to show them one or two times and then just kind of see how their ability to replicate that is. And then number two, I'm going to really evaluate what I see as compared to what they feel. And with the fascial system, one thing that is uh, unique to the fascial system is the concept of interoception, or in other words, the sensory bodies that are responsible for detecting how we feel about how we feel. And I think that the, the, you know, by doing the assessment in this manner where I know what I'm seeing and I'm comparing it to what they're feeling, I think that gives me a really good starting ground 
for trying to close the gap between those two. You know, and we see this in both ends. I, I've had athletes that are all over the place, can't hold a single leg balance, can't do a lunge with rotation. And I'm like, hey, how do we feel on that one? And he's like, felt great. I'm like, okay, we're going to have a lot of work to do, you know? And then I've had other athletes that come in and move as close to perfect as you could imagine. And, I'm, and I ask him again, how'd you feel on that? Man, I just, you know, my foot was re- starting to drop medially when I rotated over my left shoulder and I felt my knee coming. I'm like, okay. So not only does that give me an idea of how they understand their movement in, in comparison to what I see or evaluate, but it also gives me a great talking point for how I'm going to be able to instruct and improve these things. And I think that the ability to, you know, develop movement literacy and comprehension is is a fundamental responsibility for coaches for sure. So between the subjective qualitative analysis of the fascial line assessment, um, you know, to kind of get the mechanics or the movement uh, assessed, from that point, when we think about the dynamics of it, it's really anything that anybody would look to uh, to go to for the sake of measuring the tenderness components or the elasticity of the athletes. So. I like to do uh, a, a single leg triple uh, triple jump or a triple bound. I like to do um, a single leg drop jump to a vertical jump, so essentially an RSI. And then I like to do some kind of a med ball movement. So if they're a throwing athlete, it'll reflect more of that throwing pattern. If they're more of a like an offensive lineman for football, it'll be more so of a hip toss. And I, I am just looking at these things from the lens of the fascial integrity and the ability to produce elasticity. So that's probably something I should have mentioned at the start of this, but really the broadest difference is more between this conventional and fascial approach is really more so a change in perspective than it is in practice. 80 to 90% of what I'm doing is not unique or different than, than any other practitioner or strength and conditioning coach. It's all the same stuff but the perspective of which I'm evaluating it and then implementing strategies for what I'm evaluating is probably slightly different. And that's where this fascial stuff has really, you know, kind of showed its value for me. It's good. Let's dive into some of those assessments because if someone was to view you run through a couple of the assessments that you've just mentioned, forward lunge, backward lunge, drop jump, uh, drop jump and then a, and then a rebound, Things like that. If anyone was looking from the outside, they would just think that's just a normal screening of movement. Like if you didn't actually say anything or couldn't get inside your head. So would you mind setting these things up in terms of how you're thinking and feel free to take any of the examples that you've mentioned and maybe contrast the two, contrast the two of how a normal movement screen may may go or may you used to have gone with you potentially before you went down this road and then how you think differently now just to give people though that kind of contrast of okay Danny that this sounds great but what is actually different how are you actually thinking yeah so I think the first point is I'm looking at things from an integrative perspective more so than an isolated and and I think if we look at, you know, the kind of the history of, of muscular based testing, it's all isolated. It, it's, you know, we're looking at, you know, peak isometric force on a quad single leg extension, you know, so it's, it's just much more of a, a, an isolated view, whereas my interest is much more the integration of movement. So that first assessment, you know, we have them go into an anterior lunge with a, a quarter rotation or with a coiling pattern and then directly into a reverse lunge with an overhead reach. So the number one thing that I'm looking at on that is how do they sequence forwards to backwards and then backwards to forwards. And we can get very technical and nitpicky on this, right? You know, somebody who does not transition back from an anterior lunge could just have weak quadriceps. I fully understand that. But I also have seen plenty of cases where athletes can hold 7,500 pound dumbbells and do split squats or a rear foot elevated split squat but when I have them do that anterior to posterior lunge, they're, you know, rocking like they're on a boat and they can't control that, that movement or that coordination. So that to me is indicative of lacking this integrative nature, which again, to me goes to that fascial line and that anterior posterior line of being able to produce and then recourse or reverse the course of movement. The second thing I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, the second thing that I would say is 
all of these movement evaluations are done barefoot and they're done with a PVC pipe in the hands. So if we think about these lines as being globally integrated and running, you know, really from the occipital lobe, um, you know, for some of them all the way down to the base of the foot, coming from the anterior portion of the neck and working down through the arm line, um, and again, spanning the anterior portion of the torso, then for my interest, a fascial-based assessment or, or movement evaluation needs to have direct inter, uh, ground contact or, or interfacing with the ground, and also needs to have something that involves or demands the hands. And this is actually another one that's just been kind of interesting to me because having somebody do a movement, whatever it may be, with a PVC pipe in their hand and, and deliberately creating tension through that PVC pipe versus doing the same movement with hands on hips often look dramatically different, right? So I think that that's another aspect of this where, you know, if we think especially about throwing athletes or overhead athletes, when we're doing our evaluations, we want to make sure that we're integrating that hand. With the foot, that's really where, um, you know, a lot of my interest starts and, 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 and kind of sits because, again, for me, it's like, well, let's evaluate what they do in sport and, and virtually any sport is going to have ground contact, ground interface, and then different foot positions or what I refer to as pressurizing um, that is going to change the kinematic sequencing up the, up the chain. So I want to get kind of particular with how do they load when they're in more of a pronated position? How are they when they're more forefoot dominant or they're more hind foot dominant? And then again, supinated and everted. And with this, I've, I've just come to find that for athletes who have had a very traditionalist style of training, and it's been very linear and sagittal and isolated dominant, whenever you take them outside of that, they, they just do not navigate it very well. So for my interest being, you know, so tied to injuries and, and injury restoration, I really think that that foot position and pressurizing alone is a strong indicator for how they're going to be able to, you know, navigate and withstand different forces and different vectors that are going to be demanded of them in sport. So when we look at it from that lens, then it goes to the trunk and, you know, the base of support relative to the center of mass is a, is a critical factor for, for ACL injuries specifically. And I think that that's another thing that, you know, it's just been remiss in a lot of the foundational stuff is that relationship between where the foot is, where the pressure in the foot is, and then how the trunk is positioned, you know, in relation to that. So whether we say that that is, you know, indicative of the, the deep longitudinal line, or if that's, you know, the anterior posterior lines being in, in, in tandem and working, you know, congruently above and below the hip, or if we just change that terminology to some of the more conventional terms. In either case, I think that there's a lot of significance to that. So I'm very keen on analyzing in this assessment battery, where does their trunk go relative to where their foot is? How does the, the arm position change the hand position? If I notice that somebody has trouble maintaining a full grip on a PVC pipe, which happens a lot more than I would have expected, um, then I'm going to go take a deeper look at the shoulder capsule because normally the loss of grip or the inability to create a closed grip on something, especially in an overhead position, is indicative of some kind of a, of a shoulder limitation or deficit. So I think it's a very broad and general way of, of giving me the exact points that I really need to emphasize and hammer. And it helps me tremendously with programming. And it really just kind of helps expedite that process for me to be able to put in place more of what's needed rather than just assuming we all need dumbbell RDLs, bent rows, and, and dumbbell shoulder presses. I just don't think that's the case. We'll get into the program in a second. But with, with so much going on, with so much detail there, as you've, as you've men for, mentioned from starting right at the bottom, right at the feet, how are you actually taking note of all this given how subjective it can be so then you can progressively monitor and, and understand if this person's improving and especially with the integration of how do you feel? Like, how did that go? And then marrying up with what you actually saw. How does this come together into a, a kind of coherent system? Yeah. So uh, the I guess the first thing is, is like, I've never had the opportunity to work in a university setting for five or six years where I had force plate analysis and I had, you know, all of these 
you know, supporting modalities and supporting measures um, to help drive my program. I, I sure wish I have, um, but I have, right? So for me, it's a little bit more of, uh, you know, being resourceful, so to speak. But with that being said, I think that the the number one thing that that I take away from it is really trying to develop and and continue to work on the coaching eye and being able to really analyze movement for what it is and and the the best that I've ever seen for this is Dan Pfaff. Uh watching any kind of film analysis with him is quite intimidating. Um it it really makes you feel like an amateur very quickly. Um, you know, and even just the other week when we were down there and we're at the track and he's watching somebody, you know, approach for a, a long jump and, you know, and he just casually leans over and he's, you know, do you see how the right hip is more retroverted when he goes into his third step? And I'm like, how in the world can you quantify that or analyze that? So I think that the coaching eye is something that, you know, despite the evolutions of technology and all of the resources that are becoming available to us, which are fantastic. We can't lose sight of that. That's that's at the end of the day, that is a fundamental aptitude for coaches. One thing I did kind of gloss over, um, you know, RSI jumps are are a good evaluator for me. Um, and again, it's it's something that a lot of people are familiar with and practicing. Um, so if we're looking at the the time spent on the ground versus the time spent in air, that to me is a major separator for programming purposes. Um, you know, so for the the fascial sake of this. Uh, really, the the lack of flight time is more indicative of there being a a deficiency for elasticity or propulsion. So if if that's the case, then we're just going to kind of attune the programming to speak more to that side. Whereas for somebody who is just more heavy footed and and can't really you know get off the ground or express very much, then we're going to have a different file for how we're going to program against that. The last measure um, that you know and and <laughs> I'll share a little bit about this. Um, that I think is a really good one for, for the sake of fascial evaluation is, is really looking at time to stabilize. Um, I think that that's something that, you know, if you take any specific force plate measure and, and variable, we can have an endless discussion back and forth about, well, that's more tendinous, not fascial. Well, it's maybe more fascial. No, it's more this, right? Time to stabilize is kind of a unique one. It, it's one that really isn't tendon, tendon driven. And it's one that does require motor unit integration and intermuscular coordination, um, intramuscular coordination as well. Um, and I think that that is something that speaks more directly to the proprioceptive and mechanoreceptive acuity of the fascial tissue as opposed to just the muscle belly itself. Um, so those are the things that I would say are probably my top criteria. Um, and, and really, again, as we all know, these are just things that we're looking at for the sake of making programming more actionable and more efficient. Okay, let's, let's dive into the, the program in itself. So you've mentioned a couple of examples. One particular one that you'd, you'd mentioned was the guy, that, or central girl, that was strong in the rear for elevated split squat, but when returning from a lunge was all over the place. So you've seen that. That's, that's the example we'll use if that's all right. You've seen that. You understand it's not a strength thing. What does where does that lead your mind when it comes to okay we've got a training session with this person in the next hour for the next hour how are you gonna address that in a in a way that is attuned with this kind of way of thinking versus a traditional way will you just take us through that yeah. process yeah so if um if we start this by just suggesting you know okay what is the uh, what is the fascial toolkit? What is the what are the 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 bases of of a fascial based training approach? I would very simply say it's unilaterally and contralaterally dominant. We're going to have a, a very minimal amount of, of bilateral load. It's going to be more developed around the pursuit of ability to tolerate variability as opposed to pursuing progressive overload. We're going to have more open based movements, less constraint as opposed to more muscularly driven programming being more closed chain, isolated focus. Um, in a fascial based approach, we're going to emphasize more of the in intrinsic stability as opposed to the extrinsic stability. And with fascial based approach, we're going to look more towards the rate of movement as opposed to the time under tension. So understanding those two broad differences, 
Um, oh, and the other one being uh, planes of motion. So in, in a fascial based approach, we're, we're omnidirectional. We're trying to move in really as many different planes as we can create. Uh, the three cardinal plane is, is one of the most reductionist things in the world to me. I've never understood um, why we ascribe to that. It's, it's really silly to me. Um, but if we understand those broad differences, we can again look at this and say, okay, there's a time and a place for there to be a muscularly based approach. I'm never going to feel otherwise about that. But there's also this time and place where we want to be a little bit more fascially oriented. So with this example of the, the rear foot elevated split squat, this was something that was very prevalent with the military population. You load them up, they move pretty good, right? And, and let me say, you load them up and you move in one direction, they're, they're solid, nine out of 10 times, right? If you unload them and ask them to move in an array of, of vectors or, or planes, most of them struggle. And this was something that took me a little while to comprehend, but it just kind of occurred to me one day. I was like, oh, well, when they're on, on the job, they're under 25 to 45 pounds of external mass at all times. Then you have the, the helmet and the nods, which is about seven to nine, to nine pounds additional. So for this population, being out of kit is actually unfamiliar to them. So when we're in the training setting, giving them load is familiar and unloading them is completely unfamiliar. And I, it, it was actually during sprint, I was trying to, to develop sprinting, right? And, and speed training with this population. And it, again, it took me a little while, but eventually we got to a point where my speed introduction for that military population started with weighted sled runs because they couldn't figure out how to orient and, and really position themselves without that external resistance. So that was a key thing for me to understand um, or to recognize rather where, you know, having them tow 25, 45 pounds was actually cleaning up mechanics. So I was like, ah, okay, this is, this is something we should kind of dig on this a little bit. So with the situation of the 75, whatever pounds <clears throat> split squat looking good, the unloaded rear foot split squat looking bad. The first thing that I want to do is focus on mechanical coupling. So I'll use the you know derivatives of the spring uh, spring ankle series from Cal Dietz. I'll use a variation of wall patterns. Um, we will do some you know kind of sled and and um, you know more locomotive uh, very uh, variations that are that are very lightly if at all loaded, and really teach this concept of intermuscular coordination. Starting with the, the foot and the lower leg, right? Being able to suspend the heel, put the knee over the toe and get force coupling above and below the ankle. And then again, above and below the knee is critical. Um, being able to manipulate, manage and, and move the upper body unloaded. So a lot of bridging, crawling patterns, uh, plank push-up variations and things of that nature. And just doing them in a way that's organized to these fascial lines. So for a bear crawl, for instance, you know, putting the right hand out above and then lifting and reaching the opposite hand out to the side of the body and then taking two steps. And now we're going to put the left hand down and reach the left or the right leg back and just really owning those positions and being able to integrate. So with the, the split squat, it's the same concept. And then once we get past that force coupling phase, now I just want to add velocity to it. So I'll actually sometimes underload them or utilize, you know, bands above to kind of help teach them to be faster in that bottom position. And I think it's really almost entirely a, a proprioceptive or a sensory thing or a neuromuscular um, aptitude of being able to control speeds at terminal ranges and then integrate them into a different vector rapidly. So it is a trainable and a teachable trait that I think just kind of gets overlooked a lot and we don't necessarily put the same priority to it. The last thing that I'll mention on that is I believe that moving in more lateral or in more rotational planes of motion helps clean up a lot of that sagittal movement. You know, so if we think about the split squat, what's happening at the pelvis when one leg is extended and one leg is flexed. Okay. Well, we have different muscle, you know, compartments and different, um, muscular relationships on each side of the, the pelvis, but then also in the trunk. 
And then on the leg that's being loaded, we're getting a lot more adductor and abductor, you know, when we don't have load present, because now we don't have something to stabilize against. We have to intrinsically stabilize. So if we take that athlete and we start working more of the AB80 ductor groups and we start working some of the trunk mechanics that are involved there without load, I think it goes back and, and directly correlates to being more stable in that sagittal or in that, you know, linear plane of motion when, when we're unloaded. Just out of interest, how did the military guys or the Navy SEAL guys that you were working with react to this more integrated approach, this, this approach that had much more variability, different planes of motion, different speeds, when maybe in their mind, I don't know if they're seeing that within their, you know, day-to-day jobs I'm not, I'm not quite sure how did they take to that this kind of new approach it was um humbling for sure at first for them um i i know it was it, it really caught a lot of guys off guard because again you got to remember what we're comparing to i mean literally like the most insane impossible physical ed- endeavors that you could imagine and some of the things that they do is is truly mind-blowing so when I have somebody in a in a crab bridge or if I have somebody in a spring ankle and they're sitting there shaking, you know, and, and can't control their body and getting completely fatigued, it, it got attention for sure. The 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 secondary point is, you know, and again, I understand that this is just anecdotal, but um, man, we got rid of a lot of pain. People came in in pain and unable to move and unable to walk without their shoes on or squat past x degrees of motion or put their arm over their head um and we had a lot of success with it and um you know so i think from that standpoint like the old saying you know people will forget what you did they'll forget what you say but people will never forget how you made them feel and so we had a lot of people that truly you know not only ascribed to what we were we were putting out but really loved what we were doing because it got them out of pain. And for that, you know, I I personally could never ask for more um, because it was truly impactful for them, both from a professional and from a personal uh, point of view. And then I think the last thing is, is, you know, they they really quickly recognized um, the transferability to that because again, their world is so unpredictable and there's literally an infinite amount of variables. And you think about different terrains and you think about, you know, different pitches of you know, mountains and and hikes and things that they're climbing. And you think about being on sand versus on land. So I think that they really appreciated the variability because it quite literally translated directly to what they do. In terms of a pain reduction, and this is, again, this is pretty reductionist of me to ask this, but in terms of pain management and pain reduction, what is it about this? What is the biggest thing about this system that, that, that ticks that box that helps that yeah well the first thing is is the the amount of of nociceptors and and proprioceptive bodies that are found in fascial tissue um you know there's there's been quite a few studies now i believe this this one is from uh robert schleip um that that proposes that there are about six times the amount of proprioceptive bodies in fascial tissue as compared to the same surface area of muscle muscular tissue or otherwise um so i think that's really the 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 foremost priority is that the the receptors are are being attuned to how they can you know essentially understand and and detect the the inputs or the stressors that are being applied and then you know going from being in a chronic state of pain because that's the thing you know is like pain with movement a lot of the times is a sensory malfunction it's not necessarily a physical abnormality or deficit it's it's the sensory network so if we can retrain and reteach the body that, hey, no, this position is not bad, you're okay, you can get above that position, and then we do the inputs that are required to help facilitate that, then the body can register it and, and take it on as, as no longer being painful. Um, you know, I think a good euphemism for this is like, you know, thinking about the way that, that cars are developed now and how you know, there's, there's sensors everywhere. There's sensors in your tires and your, in your wheels. And then, you know, all around the body of the car and they're constantly just detecting what that external environment is. And anytime a car merges over, right. 
So it's similar to the human body in the sense that there's always this amplified protection and protective um, and evolutionary mechanism that's occurring for the sake of our longevity um, and to be safe and, and, and non-threatened. So no differently than how we have to, quote unquote, override GTOs, right, for, for tolerating forces. It's very similar with the proprioceptive and the, uh, the nociceptive response in that we need to reteach and retrain the body that these aren't painful patterns. You just haven't done them in a long time or you just haven't really you know, been in a good position when you have X, Y, or Z going on. I'd like to, as probably a, one of the last things that we, that we discuss is the importance of the foot and the training of the foot and ankle within this system. And we've had a couple of people on the podcast who've discussed this in detail, a couple of guys from Europe, a uh, particular guy from, from the UK. When it comes to isolating the foot and how you see the importance of training it and, and how you, I suppose, build a philosophy around the the fascial system and, you know, from a from a, a nutritional system to, to, to train the foot, how do you go about it in practice? What does that actually look like? And I suppose what emphasis and importance do you place on it? within your system, within your philosophy? Yeah. So it, this, I, I understand why I get pushback on the fascial stuff sometimes. I truly do. I, I do not understand why there's pushback on foot-specific training. That, to me, really doesn't make sense. Because, again, it's like it, it is such an elemental part of any sport. Why don't we give that more credence? But I look at strengthening or improving foot function really from four base pillars. And the first one is that sensory motor component. I think that being out of your or being in your shoes all the time, all day dampens that sensory motor acuity. Um, it basically, if the foot is, or I'm sorry, if the shoe is taking on that ground interface for the foot and it's, a, it's adapting for the foot in terms of compliance and what that environment uh, consists of or that terrain consists of, then those sensors are downregulated. If they're not needed, they're not going to be stimulated. So I think just getting pure ground interaction with the foot is easy. It's it's something you you don't need to change anything about your programming. Just add it into the warm up or add it into some of the accessory work. Add it into your rudiment plyo series, and from the sensory standpoint alone, you're going to get a lot of value out of that. The second thing is the intrinsic foot muscles or the ability to eccentrically splay and load through the foot. Uh, I think about this like force channels. So if we have five toes, five metatarsals, and we create ground contact with the foot, there should be a pretty even distribution of ground force coming through the foot, you know, through those five channels, so to speak. So if we aren't able to supinate or invert, invert the foot, then essentially we've lost two channels. So now we have to take what was once five and load through three points. And I think that that leads to mechanical overload and, and, and essentially breaking down certain parts of the lower leg. So the intrinsic foot muscles are very easy to, to train as well. It starts again by getting out of your shoes. But from there, we want to be able to focus on splaying and melting the foot into the ground. Um, so I think about this as having a broader surface area with the ground gives us a better opportunity to create stability. So anything barefoot, single leg is going to start training those intrinsic foot muscles, hinging, lunging, anything. From there, once we've done more of the static components, I'll look to more of those rudiments. I think that A series, top series, skip series, all of those are, are primary ways that you can load the intrinsic foot muscles. The third point is foot compliance or the ability to interface and interact with the ground you know, with different vectors or different directions of force. So for the foot compliance, I really want to go back to, you know, working in more of that lateral frontal plane type of motion, working it, you know, to transition or sequence from forwards to backwards, uh, working at, you know, different up to or ob obscure angles, um, and basically really trying to focus on things that challenge the uh, transition from more of the lateral border to more of the medial border or vice versa. And then the fourth pillar um, is going to be the windlass mechanism or the suspended heel. So essentially being able to fully mechanically load the plantar arches and being able to do so 
without having a drop in that heel position. So I use the spring ankle series from Cal Dietz. I probably program that more than anything else into like one, one for one. Um, that's in almost everybody's warm up that I'm doing. I'll use that as an intraset option. Um, and, and I've added a couple of little steps to that spring ankle series, but that one checks several boxes, uh, certainly the windlass, but also the compliance and, and, you know, the, uh, intrinsic foot muscles as well. And then I'll layer this into programming, um, quite a bit. So instead of just doing a front foot elevated split squat with the heel completely flat and flush to the ground or to the box or whatever it is, um, I'll just have the forefoot on there. Um, for rear foot elevated split squats, rather than just doing them with the heel down, I'll elevate the heel and do it for more of a forefoot loading. Um, so a lot of the foot stuff that I'm doing isn't like specific mini band drills. You're going to spend 15 minutes doing this, that, and that. I try to really influence that throughout other things that we need to do. But rather than focusing on, again, for the rear foot, rather than focusing on, you know, 10 pounds more each week or you know, just working on the progressive overloading of it, I want to do the same amount of load, but now change the foot position and do that for two weeks. And then we'll load more or then we'll add tempo to it. Um, you know, doing some of the rudiment series barefoot as opposed to just trying to do them faster or for longer durations. I just think that these are ways that we can build these things in and kind of collectively, you know, I guess, kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. Understood. Superb. Well, I think this is this is offered a, a really unique perspective. And like I said, right at the start, something that hasn't been dived into at all on the podcast for whatever reason. But it's great to get you on, Danny, and, and, and have a chat about this. If anyone wants to check out uh, any resources that you've got or more thoughts on this particular area on, or any particular area, where's the best place for people to go? Well, for the fascial stuff specifically, um, you know, our marquee product right now is the Fascia Chronicles. Um, I'm happy to I'll, I'll send you a little uh, sports myth code for this, too. So for anybody who's listening, you know, we can knock 20 percent off of that. Um, that that was a course that I put together with uh, my business partner, Jeremy Aspa, and then a good friend of mine, Rob Umfris. So it's not just me, um, you know, talking ad nauseum. Uh, there's some different perspectives within that that are really, really good. Um, that was our, our philosophical fascial concept, uh, product, right? You know, we, we definitely get into, to a lot of the practical stuff and a lot of the, the actionable stuff, but really it was me having this, this question of, you know, what is it? Why does it matter? What, you know, all of these different common things. And we addressed a lot of those. Um, and, and I'm actually very proud to say that that, that product has been very well received. Um, and I'll, I'll drop a little self plug here, uh, according to Stu McMillan is the most underpriced uh, continuing ed product out there. So um, for whatever that's worth to anybody, um, but I've got a ton of free resources as well. Um, I, like I mentioned, I did just put out a fascia line assessment ebook that's free on our website. And I think I've written over 30 or 40 articles now. Um, we've got some stuff on the YouTube channel. So I've got plenty of resources and um, you know, some more on the way here. We're, uh, we're now gearing up for the next big one. So a couple more things on the way this year. Sounds good. And social media wise, Danny? Yep. Um, Instagram and Twitter. Um, I refuse to get anything else. I've, I've, you know, made a firm stand on that. Once these two die, that's it for me. But uh, Instagram and, and Twitter, I'm, uh, I believe it's uh, at Danny underscore rude, rude rock for both of those. Um, and then we have our, our company page as well at rude rock strength on Instagram. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely put out a lot of stuff on the social media uh, pages as well. So those are, those are good resources for people. Love that. Well, I'm going to let you go crack on with your morning, but, uh, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much for your time and we'll keep in touch and looking forward to publishing your, your article on Sportsmith as well. Man, Rob, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, man. I really appreciate you. Thanks mate. Speak soon.